For two years, I've been telling you the same thing about the anti-oil sands protesters in Canada. Follow the money. I've been telling you that their campaign isn't real. It's not Canadian. It's not authentic. It's not your neighbors genuinely concerned about the environment and choosing to voluntarily get involved in politics. It's professional campaigners and activists, highly paid by foreign interests. Well, today I have shocking news about who has been paying for Neil Young's propaganda campaign. You're going to be disgusted, not just with Neil Young, not just with the people paying for his campaign, but with the Canadian government that has been subsidizing this. I'll show you documentary proof, the result of a Sun News investigation. While the media party has been busy fawning all over Neil Young, asking him for autographs and talking with him about how cool the 60s were, we were doing real reporting in the Canadian national interest. I'll show you the smoking gun in a few moments. But first, let me remind you of how widespread this foreign interference in our economy has been and for how long. I've shown you this 48-page campaign document before. It's an internal planning document by the New York-based Rockefeller Brothers Fund outlining in meticulous detail their $7 million a year plan to attack the oil sands and pipelines using political activism, propaganda, and lawsuits. The plan was hatched in 2008, so it's now in its sixth year. That's more than $40 million of anti-Canada propaganda from the Rockefellers alone. I've shown you the list of the Rockefellers' Canadian frontmen, mercenaries, really, who have been only too happy to take that foreign money in exchange for attacking the Canadian oil sands and their fellow Canadians who earn a living there. You can see page 12 of the Rockefeller campaign plan, groups like Greenpeace, the Pembina Institute, the World Wildlife Fund Canada, the Sierra Club, and a group called Environmental Defense. They have a specific strategy of hiring Aboriginal actors and lobbyists to hide the fact that they're actually a bunch of foreign meddlers here. Look right there on page 36, First Nations Legal Challenges. See, if a rich billionaire trust fund kid comes up from New York and says, stop your Canadian oil sands, we tell them to beat it. But these Rockefellers are smarter than that. They pay to hire Indian actors to Aboriginalize this U.S. attack on Canada. This foreign money buys a lot of things. Anti-oil sands propaganda, anti-oil sands campaigners, anti-oil sands speeches. But it also pays for lawbreaking too. Here's proof. Last summer, we showed you an environmental defense employee named Alicia Patron running an illegal six-day break-and-enter operation of an oil pipeline pumping station in Westover, Ontario. Environmental defense is one of those Rockefeller Brothers cash recipients. They even had their corporate logo on the crime scene. Same with Greenpeace. Just a few months ago, they broke into an oil pipeline pumping station in Vancouver, putting the safety of that pipeline in danger and even risking causing an oil spill. Greenpeace, too, as you saw, was bought and paid for by the Rockefellers. In fact, it's hard to name a single anti-oil sands group that isn't on the take from foreign financiers. In B.C., the largest group opposed to the Northern Gateway Pipeline was the Dogwood Initiative. They claimed they signed up more than 1,000 people to testify against the Northern Gateway Pipeline, bogging it down in red tape and hearings just to gum up the works. Here's their campaign boss, Eric Swanson, bragging about how he loves foreign money. Why are you allowing foreign interests to dictate to Canadians what's best for us? If I got duffel bags of money delivered from Martians or from outer space, I would still take that money. Of course he would. I've shown you all this for years. I've asked a dozen times why the Canadian government gives charitable tax status to many of these highly political lobby groups. Let me say that again. Groups like the Pembina Foundation, the Sierra Club Foundation, Environmental Defense, the World Wildlife Fund Canada, they actually pay no taxes in Canada because they claim they're charities as if they're like orphanages or food banks or homeless shelters. Of course, they're not. They're political lobby groups. But the Conservative government of Canada gives them tax-free status. You are effectively subsidizing this war on Canada. Which brings me to Neil Young's latest stunt. Look, he's an idiot. He wrote some interesting songs way back in the day, and he's probably set some sort of human record for drug use in his life. But I mean, if Miley Cyrus or Rihanna came up here and told us everything they knew about the oil sands, which would take about 30 seconds, and then kept talking for a whole week, would all the media be reporting it? 
Well, the answer is embarrassingly yes, yes we would, because we're Canadians and for some weird reason we give a damn if some know-nothing U.S. celebrity burps out an incoherent, ill-informed opinion about a complex economic and environmental project like the oil sands. We ignore Canadian experts on the subject, but we take our marching orders from low-information Americans, paid for by malicious anti-oil sands lobby groups, who only seem to criticize Canadian oil and never protest against OPEC oil, they're paid lobbyists. They're not genuine. Oh, what? D did you think Neil Young was paying for all the anti-oil sense propaganda of his tour? Do you think all the spin doctors and handlers and event organizers were free or that maybe Neil Young paid for them from his own fortune? Have you ever seen Neil Young protest outside the Saudi embassy? Of course not. There's no money in it for him. Neil Young's worth 65 million bucks. He cares a hell of a lot about money. Neil Young left Canada almost 50 years ago. He lives on a 1,500-acre estate in California now, with additional houses in Florida and Hawaii. He knows nothing about the oil sands. He's all about America now. Songs about them, benefit concerts for American farmers, not Canadian farmers, that sort of thing. So the anti-oil sands campaigners had to add a special Canadian touch to this American multimillionaire coming up here to lecture us. Now, sure, David Suzuki was part of his tour, but everyone knows Suzuki's for hire. He gives speeches for 30000 bucks a pop. It's not really news if Suzuki shows up at one of these corporate Blame Canada events. So to Canadianize Neil Young's anti-oil sands campaign, they did what they said they do in their campaign plan that I showed you. They aboriginalized him. They said the whole thing wasn't about some old white hippie from California. It was about an Indian band that Neil Young says he's coming up here to help. They're called the Athabasca Chippewan First Nation. Neil Young was on stage in Toronto with their chief, Alan Adam, who jetted in just for the spectacle. Young says he's raising money for Chief Adam and his Indian band to sue to stop the oil sands, which is weird because pretty much everyone with a job in that Indian band works for the oil sands, directly or indirectly. Now, uh, let's look at a map. Look how far north Fort Chippewan is. What do you think you can do for a living up there if it weren't for the oil sands? There's not even a year-round road to Fort Chip. It's so remote. You have to take a plane there. I mean, you could trap or fish or hunt. Not really a lot of money in that, so you can have a subsistence lifestyle, but nobody wants that in 2014. Not Indians. They want all the benefits of modern life, from pickup trucks to the snowmobiles to internet and satellite TV. So they work for the oil sands. All the oil sands companies compete to hire those Fort Chip band members because the companies all want to build bridges with the local communities to involve them in their projects. They want as many Aboriginal workers as possible. And they're right there in northern Alberta. I mean, if you've got an able-bodied young person in Fort Chippewan who wants to work, that's probably better for the oil company than having to fly someone in from thousands of miles away or even hire foreign temporary workers. I was talking with one Indian from Fort Chip who says the companies start recruiting workers while they're still in high school, they come to the schools on career days, offering the kids a job, including skills training, like driving a big truck or welding or whatever, on one condition, that these Indian kids finish high school. And it's working. It's amazing. These oil companies are getting the kids not to drop out. And then they train them in a skilled trade and pay them six figures, not just Fort Chip, but Fort Mackay, too. 100% unemployment, 100%. Now, it wasn't always this way, of course. Before the big oil sands boom kicked in about 10 years ago, it was the opposite. Fort Chip had 90% unemployment. Now anyone who wants a job has one, either working directly for one of the oil companies, thousands of Indians do, or for the band's own oil sands companies. The Athabasca Chippewan First Nation, that's the group that Neil Young knows so well because, you see, he sat down with the chief for an hour once. That Indian band started its first oil sands contracting company back in 1994, doing contract work for Syncru. They had five employees back then. Well, today they have six band-owned oil sands companies. Chief Adams' Indian band owns them. They have seven joint ventures with different oil sands companies. You know what a joint venture means? It means they co-own the project, the Indian band does. Basic stuff like cleaning and catering to more technical work like manufacturing, steel fabrication, road building. Do you know how many people work for the Athabasca Chippewan First Nations oil sands companies today? 1,400, which is quite something because there are only 1,100 Indians in the whole band. Let me say that again. There are 1,100 men, women, and children 
who were members of this Indian band. And yet there are 1,400 people who work for its oil sands companies, as in it's such a roaring success, it hires other people too. There is so much oil sands action, only about 200 band members actually live on the Indian Reserve. The other 900 live and work off the reserve, closer to the oil sands operations. Let me say that again. These Indians actually choose to leave their reserve where the land is free and go to work. Of course they do. You know why? Because they're all millionaires, or will be soon. Last year, the Athabasca Chip won First Nations oil sands contracts, pulled in $250 million. A quarter of a billion dollars. For an Indian band of 1,100 people, that's 250 families. 250 families, 250 million bucks each year. Now, that's revenues. There are costs, obviously, but these are very, very rich people. Not quite Neil Young rich. I mean, he's worth 65 million bucks, but every family in Fort Chip is pretty much a millionaire. And, of course, they don't pay any taxes on the reserve. So no wonder when Neil Young was white-splaining to everyone why he wants to shut down the oil sands, even though he really, really respects everyone who works there. Well, you see, Chief Adam, Neil Young's good friend, ever since that one time they met for an hour, well, Chief Adam had a bit of a different point of view. Here's Neil Young's bestest friend saying, yeah, man, I like hanging out with you because you're a rock star, but you're crazy if you want to shut down my quarter-billion-dollar-a-year company. Look. At this point in time, sure, the benefits outweigh the costs in regards to the First Nations to be self-sufficient at this, you know, uh, from more areas than one. Yeah, the benefits outweigh the costs, I'll say. So the group that Neil Young wants to help save from the oil sands, yeah, they don't want to be saved. They're grossing an average of a million bucks a family through the Indian band alone. I mean, the band with 1,100 men, women, and children that employs 1,400 people. This is what Neil Young calls Hiroshima. What an idiot. That's fact number one. But don't you go anywhere. The shocking news about who's paying for this propaganda is still to come. So I just told you about Neil Young's anti-oil sands tour and how it just doesn't make sense that a chief whose band's unemployment has been taken care of by the oil sands, who's profiting off the oil sands and making his band millionaires, is going along with Neil Young's anti-oil spiel. I mean, that's fact number one, but here's fact number two. This whole protest, this fake propaganda exercise was paid for by a San Francisco anti-oil sands lobby group called the Tides Foundation. I said it, well, now let me prove it. This is the annual report that the Tides Foundation files with the United States IRS. It's called their Form 990. It lists the money that Tides gave to various lobbyists around the world. As you can see from the first page, they spent more than $100 million last year on left-wing causes. Tides especially, by the way, is letting billionaires donate secretly, as in their identity is kept secret. Their money is laundered through a charitable number, keeping their identity secret to do political attacks here on Canada. So who is donating this money? They just won't say. Is it ideological meddlers? Is it Americans who don't want us to have another export customer for our oil, so we'll have to continue selling oil to the U.S. alone at a steep discount because we're landlocked? Who knows? Maybe it's an OPEC oil company that really hates our competition. We don't know. Tides won't say. Tides is in San Francisco, but they literally donated to 25 different anti-oil sands groups last year alone. 25! So if you read the news in Canada and see group after group after group of anti-oil sands activists, you might be thinking, wow, the whole country is opposed to the oil sands and pipelines and development. Public opinion is against oil and gas. Well, yeah, no, it's not 25 groups. It's one group of rich foreigners in San Francisco with 25 different hired guns in Canada, one octopus with a bunch of tentacles, except octopuses typically have just eight arms, not 25. Oh, and that's just Tide's San Francisco office. They opened a Vancouver office, and that hands out even more dough. We'll have to do a whole show on these 25 mercenary groups another day. But for today, my point is just this. The Tides Foundation paid for Neil Young's stunt. Here, here's a detail from Tides Form 990. Look at that. Tides wired $45,000 to a company called 850450 Alberta for, quote, Athabasca Chippewan First Nations research, education, and outreach on climate tar sands-related issues. 
and then another wire transfer of $10,000 for the same thing again, 55 grand total. And according to the Financial Post, another 55 grand was paid to a numbered company on the reserve in 2013 to, quote, build public opposition to tar sands and pipelines, unquote. Now, this is a drop in the bucket compared to the quarter billion dollars the band gets every year for working for the oil sands. But who is this numbered company, 850-450 Alberta? Well, I checked. Here's their corporate records filed with the Alberta Corporate Registry. They're a numbered company owned by another company called the Acton Group. Well, well, who are they? Well, they've changed their names a few times. ACFN Holding Corporation, ACFN Business Group Limited. Hang on, hang on, hang on. ACFN. That's the initials of the Indian band itself, isn't it? Athabasca, Chippewan, First Nation. And, and hang on, look at that. It's a list of directors. Look right there. Look at that very first name. Alan Adam. Hey, isn't that the name of the Indian chief? The one who was sitting next to Neil Young? <laughs> the one who said, well, hang on there, white man. The pros outweigh the cons on this whole oil sands thing. Well, just barely. The quarter billion a year we make is just barely better than your white man's orders that we go back to a lifestyle of hunting and trapping. But if you scroll down, you'll see that the directors of this company are all band members of the Indian band. They're the shareholders of this company holding in trust for the band. The Tides Foundation out of San Francisco has been shoveling money right into the companies owned and controlled by the Indian chief and council in return for them participating in anti-oil sands propaganda. Here, let me recap. The Tides Foundation disclosed to the IRS that it was giving money to a numbered company in Canada for the specific purpose of fighting against the oil sands in Fort Chippewan. And that numbered company just happens to be owned and controlled by the politicians who run the Fort Chippewan Indian Band? And keeping up his end of the bargain, the Indian chief, who is a director and shareholder of that numbered company that took the dough, did in fact show up for Neil Young's Blame Canada tour, quid pro quo. He didn't even have to wait for the check in the mail. Tide says they wired it straight to the company's bank account. This whole stunt is a bought and paid for by San Francisco billionaires stunt. They hire Indians as actors, really. In this case, they rented a chief for the sum of 55 grand a year to show up, I don't know, maybe hold an eagle feather and say something deep to aboriginalize their white man's war against Canada. Now, of course, 55 grand a year isn't enough to make the Indian band actually quit working in the oil sands themselves. You gotta be kidding. The oil sands means 1,400 jobs, a quarter billion dollars a year. But 55 grand is enough to get the chief to go out to Toronto and sit on the stage while Neil Young screeches a bit. I got some questions for this chief and for the Canadian government that sits idly by and watches all this anti-oil sands propaganda happen with charitable status. So I've told you that Chief Alan Adam, the chief who sat beside Neil Young while he bashed the oil sands, the same oil sands that employ all of Chief Adam's band, has taken money from the San Francisco-based Tides Foundation. I showed you the proof. It was wired directly into the bank account of a numbered company the chief controls. But I have some more questions for this chief. So last night I sent an email to Chief Adam, and today I left him a long and detailed voice message right on his cell phone. I asked him some questions. What agreements did he make with Tides? Will he release all records relating to the payment? Did they specifically mention Neil Young's tour? See, Neil Young claims he volunteered for this tour, that the whole thing was his idea, but I've learned from listening to Neil Young's attacks on the oil sands that his facts are often wrong, and his messages are in lockstep with the official Blame Canada script of the paid propagandists. It just looks so staged. It's so obvious to me. I asked Chief Adam what the total amount he and his companies have been paid by anti-oil sands groups. We know of $110,000. Was there more? I asked him why he didn't disclose these payments to the media. I asked him if he disclosed them to anyone else, like his own band members. I asked if he thought it was ethical for a politician. That's what an Indian chief is. It's like the elected mayor of an Indian reserve. I asked him if it was ethical to take large payments from foreigners to, a to adopt or promote a political point of view. And I asked him how much he is paid by Acton, the company that took the money. How much did he take or his family? I asked him how much he earned 
from all band budgets total. I asked him how he can square accepting anti-oil sands money and being part of Neil Young's anti-oil sands hate tour with the fact that his band earned a quarter billion dollars last year from the oil sands. I asked him if he thought it was in the fiduciary interests of his members to bite the hand that feeds them so luxuriously. I told him I'd love to have him on the show, in studio, via Skype, or even if he just wrote me a letter. I told him I'd give him plenty of time, even the last word. I haven't heard back from him. If I do, I promise I'll let you know. But these aren't just questions for him. I think they're questions for the Indian Affairs Minister, Bernard Valcour. How does he feel that foreign lobby groups are paying cash, wiring it directly into the bank accounts of companies owned and controlled by Indian politicians for the explicit purpose of getting those chiefs to complain about the oil sands? And if the Tides Foundation is doing it and boasting about it to the IRS, who else is doing it on the down low? Is an OPEC-controlled oil company paying Indian chiefs to oppose pipelines in B.C.? Are any OPEC embassies making similar payments? We know that Indian chiefs have in the past taken all expense paid trips to Iran. We know this guy, the Saudi Arabian prince, has publicly attacked the oil sands. Just last week I showed you his letter. This is Saudi Prince Al-Walid calling Canada's oil and gas industry a, quote, a threat. Indian reserves are notoriously bad for financial disclosure. We know that some bands don't even keep paperwork. When Deloitte auto audited the Attawapiskat band's finances, they couldn't find any paperwork showing where fully 81% of the transactions went, including to mysterious real estate deals. In other words, it is perfect for meddling lobby groups like Tides or OPEC countries to corrupt. The only reason we found about Tides payment to the chief is because Tides disclosed it to the IRS for charitable tax credit purposes. If the Saudis were to make payments like that, they wouldn't let anyone know. But let's be candid, the Indian Affairs Minister isn't going to do anything about this. The Auditor General isn't either. They're too terrified of dealing with Indian bands between I Don't Know More and the Rexton fracking riots and their memories of Oka. They've lost their nerve to take on rogue Aboriginal extremists. Well, fine. They're not actually the problem here. They're just the cannon fodder, the hired front men. The problem here are the masterminds, the white guys from the states, the Tides Foundation, the Rockefeller Brothers Fund, and their Canadian middleman, these so-called charities like the Sierra Club Foundation. Two years ago in his 2012 budget, Finance Minister Jim Flaherty announced $8 million in new funding to audit so-called charities to crack down on their illegal political activity. Well, eight million bucks and two years later, they have decertified precisely one charity, a tiny disarmament charity. Not a single anti-oil sands political environmentalist group has had their charity status stripped. Not one. They're laughing. See, it's not just that foreign enemies are paying to fight against the oil sands. You are. Canadians. We are. Because Stephen Harper and Jim Flaherty give charitable status to groups like Tides Canada. Hey, what do you think about that? What do you think of 110,000 bucks from foreign meddlers going into the bank accounts of companies controlled by Indian politicians in return for them denouncing the oil sands? Do you like it? Do you like that you pay for it? Do you like that foreigners are interfering in our country? I'm not just talking about washed up kooks like Neil Young. I'm talking about the serious professionals, the puppet masters in San Francisco and New York. Do you like that? Eight years into a conservative government, do you like that that's still going on? I don't. I'm sick of it. If you agree, I want you to send a letter right now, right this moment, to Stephen Harper. Not the Indian minister or the auditor general. This is foreign affairs stuff now. This is national security stuff now. Canadian sovereignty stuff. The stuff of national self-respect. This is Stephen Harper's job. To stop the corruption of our political system by foreign lobbyists who think they can buy us. And in the case of Chief Adam, they were right. Send the Prime Minister an email right now. PM at pm.gc.ca. That's pm at pm.gc.ca. Tell him you want Jim Flaherty to do his job and take away the charity status of these lobby groups. Tell him you want the Indian Affairs Minister to find out if any Indian chiefs opposing the oil sands have been bribed by foreigners. Tell him that you want the Auditor General to go through the books. Tell him that you want these important decisions about our economic future, about our pipelines and oil to be made by Canadians, not by the highest bidder from San Francisco or New York.